Thank you so very kindly, Brother Eddie. And it's always a pleasure to come to these Fort Worth lectures each winter. In fact, it continues to be one of the highlights of my year, as I'm sure it is every one of you. I was just thinking back about the major themes that we have discussed in these lectureships. 1978 dealt with premillennialism. That concerned the nature of the Christian religion. 1979, we discussed the Holy Scriptures. That concerned the basic and beautiful nature of the Bible itself. In 1980, we discussed the Holy Spirit. What do you know about the Holy Spirit? And that concerned the basic nature of the third member of the Godhead. The last two years, we have discussed difficult passages in both of the Testaments, and that concerns the nature of understanding these passages. And this year, what a beautiful and thrilling theme that we have in the life and the person, the life and the labors of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a study of His bright and blessed and beautiful nature. Of course, we have much in the way of emphasis in the Bible in regard to our Savior. Something like a gigantic finger in the Old Testament points to the fact there is someone who is going to come. That was the mighty Messiah. The books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say he has come, and we have all kinds of overwhelming evidence for his deity. And the last 22 books from Romans, or rather from Acts through Revelation, tell us that he's coming again. 23 books to be a little bit more exact. But I believe that we do not overemphasize or overdraw the situation at all when we suggest that Jesus Christ is the central personality of the Bible. It's no wonder that when the apostolic preachers went forth to proclaim the gospel, that their message centered upon Jesus Christ. Paul determined not to know anything among the Corinthians save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2 and 2. When Philip went down to the city of Samaria, he preached Christ to those people. Acts 8, verses 4 and 5. And as he joined the chariot and proclaimed the gospel to the man from Africa, the Bible says that he began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Acts 8 and verse 35. And we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves yourself, and ourselves also as your servants. The emphasis, therefore, of the Bible is upon preaching Jesus Christ. Not only is the Bible an inexhaustible book, but the Lord Jesus himself is inexhaustible. Never will you and I reach the place where we can say, I know all there is to know about the Bible. Never will we reach the place where we can say, I know all there is to know about God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One of the tremendously great preachers of the past, a man by the name of Jesse L. Sewell, one time suggested that one of the reasons why he believed in the inspiration of the Bible is due to its inexhaustible character. He says, when I, or he said, when I read the book of a man, after one reading, it no longer holds a challenge to me. I believe that man has taught me about all that he's capable of teaching me. He said, not so with the Bible. And that's, when, and that's why when you and I finish reading the Bible, we feel the growing necessity of turning back and beginning the study again. And truly, as we study about Jesus and his kingdom this morning, we're studying about a personality that is inexhaustible, and we're studying about a divine institution that likewise is inexhaustible. There are two words that need to be emphasized in our title this morning, and these two words are the king and the kingdom. It would be impossible to talk about the king and ignore his kingdom. It would be virtually impossible to set forth the kingdom and ignore him who rules over it. 
who reigns over it. Hence, our lesson this morning is going to center upon both the king and his kingdom. In the early part of the New Testament, we read the question as it fell from the lips of the wise men from the Orient, from the Far East, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Matthew, the second chapter, the opening verse. We read in the latter part of the New Testament, Revelation 19 and 16, how that Jesus is spoken about as the King of kings and as the Lord of lords. We do not read very far in the New Testament until we begin to read about the kingdom of heaven. When John the Baptist or John the Immerser began to preach in the Judean wilderness, his message was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3 and verse 2. That was the early message that fell from the lips of our Lord. Matthew 4 and verse 17. Matthew is especially fond of referring to the sacred institution as kingdom of heaven or the reign of heaven in the hearts of humanity. Mark, Luke, and John speak of the kingdom of God, having had its origin in God's infinite mind, in his infinite counsels, and of course the Son came to execute that plan of establishing that kingdom and permitting the fallen sons and daughters of Adam's race to become members of the Son. It's sad, immeasurably sad, that so many people across the centuries have have misunderstood both the king and his kingdom. The Jew of the first century misunderstood the nature of the Messiah. He had built up the concept that when the Messiah came, he would be an earthly Messiah. He would be something like a second David. The people of Palestine in that day, the Israelites, We're not a free and independent nation. Long before they had been conquered by Pompey, by the Roman people, and they were serving under the slave system of Rome. They looked forward to the coming of their Messiah with a full anticipation that he will enable us to throw off the Roman yoke of bondage, that no longer will the Roman eagle and its legions of soldiers march through our country. We will again become a free and an independent nation, and again we'll come to the forefront among the nations of the world. That was their concept of the Messiah, and that's the very concept that premillennialism still has of the Messiah. They're still looking for a materialistic Messiah, just as the first century uh, Jew was. And they also misunderstood back in the first century the basic nature of his kingdom, thinking that it would be an earthly kingdom, a military kingdom, a materialistic kingdom, a kingdom that would be bounded by territory. It never dawned on those people that Jesus had come to establish not that kind of kingdom, but one that would be spiritual in its nature, one where its laws would be written and indelibly inscribed upon the hearts of humanity. And so there are many people today who have misunderstood both the Messiah and his kingdom. This morning, our purpose is twofold in nature to take a look at the glorious Messiah, and then to take a look at his glorious kingdom as we talk together about the king and his kingdom. In regard to the glorious king, the Bible teaches that he is deity, that he is divine, that he is son of God, that he is son of man, that he is one of the Godhead three. I believe that is set forth in the word that is used in the Hebrew language in Hebrews 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the word for God there is inclusive of deity, of all three persons of the Godhead. Ones that we know in later biblical history, 
as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That is set forth even in more crystal clear language as plural pronouns are used in Genesis 1 and 26. Let us make man after our image. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Male and female created a vamp. We know that Jesus had a part in creation. In fact, he was the very agent of creation. Revelation 3 and 14 sets him forth as the beginning of creation. The Jehovah's Witness people are clear off the mark of accuracy in trying to suggest that that passage means that Jehovah made the Son first, that he's the first among the created beings, and that he in turn began to create all other forms of life. As pointed out in one of the lessons yesterday, this has no reference to his being a created being. He wasn't that, but to the fact that he was the architect of creation, that he was its origin, that he was its force. He was God's, or the Father's agent, of bringing in everything into existence. John 1, 1 through 3, makes that very plain, that he was God and that he also was active in creation. We read in those passages, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Hence, as we talk about the Messiah, we see one who was God, who is God, and one who was active in creation. In regard to his being deity, there are many passages of Scripture that we would never be able to understand if we rejected his deity. For instance, in Psalm 45 and verse 6, the Lord uh, is spoken of, and another Lord is spoken of, where the first member of the Godhead said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 1, 8 and 9 refers back to this very passage. The Father speaks of the second member of the Godhead and refers to him as God. Now that's true in our reliable Bibles, the RSV, and one of the main problems with the RSV is its modernism, just as one of the main problems with the New International Version is its sectarian doctrine, its denominational theology. But the people who translated the RSV had trouble with their modernism, and they get a number of passages in the Old Testament clear out of harmonious gear with passages in the New Testament. They do that with Psalm 45 and verse 6. They remove the part that refers to him as being God and just simply says, your divine throne endures forever. I was on a lectureship program a while back where Brother Hugo McCord, one of the outstanding Hebrew scholars in our brotherhood, he suggested that the RSV erred in this, that they took away the Lord's deity and only left him with a divine throne. But if you'll recall, from such passages as 1 Kings 2 and 12 and 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 23, 29, David and Solomon both uh, sat upon divine throne or divine thrones because they sat upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord's deity ought not to have been tampered with in Psalm 45 and verse 6. It gets that passage clear out of harmonious gear with the reference in the New Testament, Hebrews 1, 8 and 9. But again, consider Micah 5 and 2, as mention is made of where the Christ child would be born, in Bethlehem, in tiny Bethlehem. And yet from that small town would come him, or would come him who was from of all, one who was everlasting, quite literally, one who was from the days of eternity. <coughs> there are some passages in the New Testament that clearly define Jesus as being deity. Physically speaking, John the Baptist was six months older than our Lord. And yet John said in John 1.15, John 1.30, 
but he was before me. He was preferred before me, for he was before me. There's only one way to understand that passage, that Jesus was deity and therefore was older than John. John was a creature of time. Jesus was eternal in his nature. This is the only way to understand a passage to which Jesus refers in Matthew the 21st chapter or the 22nd chapter. And the latter part of that chapter, uh, beginning with, or Matthew 21 it is, 41 beginning, what think ye of Christ, whose son is he? They suggested the son of David. Jesus said, how then doth David in spirit, or by inspiration say, the Lord said unto my Lord, set thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David lived about a thousand years before Jesus came to the earth. In what sense could he then be David's Lord and David's son? David's Lord from the standpoint of deity, David's son from the standpoint of humanity. I really don't believe there's ever lived a Jew that can really understand and correctly analyze this passage in the Old Testament of where the Lord said unto my Lord, a passage given to David, only one way to understand it, by an acceptation of Christ as deity, as humanity. The only way that we can understand a great passage like John 8 and 58, before Abraham was, I am. Notice the tense of the verb. Abraham, a creature of time. Jesus, no creature of time, because he is eternal in his nature. In Colossians 1, 15 through 17, he is referred to as the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things that are, for by him were all things made, whether they be things in heaven, things upon the earth, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were made by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Truly, our Lord is deity, and as deity, he is set forth in the Bible as being creator. Hence, we have two beautiful pictures of the Messiah, the Messiah as deity, and the Messiah as creator. But in the third place, I suggest that our glorious king is possessor of wonderful names. Shallow, by way of predictive prophecy, Genesis 49, verses 9 and 10. Moses referred to him as prophet in Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 17. He is the star that is to rise out of Jacob, according to a marvelous statement in the book of Numbers. He is set forth in Deuteronomy, or rather Daniel 9 and 25, as the Messiah. He is referred to in Zechariah 6 and verse 12 as the branch, the one who would rise up and build the temple of the Lord. In the book of Isaiah, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In the New Testament, he is set forth in the opening verse, the book, Biblos, as the New Testament Greek text begins, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. I teach a little children's class in many meetings in which I preach, and I have a little finger type uh, study that I teach children. One study is based upon Christ, son of five. The Bible teaches that he is the son of God, he is the son of Mary, he is the son of man, he is the son of David, he is the son of Abraham. These are wonderful names that have been given to our Lord. He is set forth as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Revelation 19 and 16. Peter referred to him as the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's a beautiful connection between three terms, Messiah, Christ, and anointed. Messiah, a Hebrew term, 
uh, crossed a Greek term, and both of them mean, as we adapt them to the English mind, the idea of his being anointed. He is the anointed one. The writer of Hebrews sets him forth in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, as being prophet, as being priest, as being king. God now speaks to us by his son. That sets him forth as prophet. He has by himself purged us from our sins. That sets him forth as our high priest. And he is set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 1, 3. That sets forth his kingly nature. <coughs> Hence we have many wonderful names given to our Lord. John 3.16 has long been known as the golden text of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm not about to accept the idea that begotten doesn't belong in a correct translation of that passage. The 47 men who translated the KJV, the 101 men who translated the American Standard, sum up a total of 148. They went on record as suggesting that monogenes, that beautiful, magnificent, and marvelous term that John uses, not only here, but four other times in his writings, ought to be translated as only begotten. I do not believe that Jesus is the only Son of God because you and I are sons of God. We're spoken of as being sons of God, but you and I are not the only begotten sons of God. I believe that John uses in a unique sense this magnificent term in referring to Jesus Christ, John 3 and 16. He does the same in John 1, 14, 1, 18, 3, 18, and then one time in his epistle, 1 John 4 and verse 9. But in the next place, the glorious king is virgin conceived and virgin born. I believe the first promise that we have of the coming king is set forth in Genesis 3 and 15. Therein he is style seed of woman. I believe that there may be a connection between Jeremiah 31 and 22, how that the Lord will make a new thing in the earth, how that a woman shall compass a man. I know that there's controversy about this passage, but a number of outstanding students believe that it's a reference to the virgin birth, how that a woman compasses a man, a man-child. Well, the Foy Wallace took that position. I believe Adam Clark does the same, or at least suggests that there is a distinct possibility that that is its meaning. But there's no doubt about Isaiah 7:14, how that the Lord promised through the prophet to give a sign, a miraculous sign, a supernatural sign, how that a virgin, not young woman, virgin, how that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. I had the opportunity one year ago of standing behind this microphone and facing a number of you and speaking for nearly all my allotted time on Isaiah 7:14. I have believed all my preaching life that it's a straight line messianic prophecy. Some of my friends, some of my preacher friends disagree. Well, I just believe they're wrong about it. I believe that nobody has ever been virgin conceived and virgin born except Jesus Christ. I do not believe that he has to share that billing with any person in Isaiah's day or any person in the age of Ahaz. I believe that we have here a straight line messianic prophecy. The prophet has his eye fixed upon a virgin and a virgin born son. And Matthew, I believe, settles it. At least he settles it for me when he says that all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, and then quotes this very passage in Isaiah 7 and verse 14. I believe that some of the new Bibles are out to destroy the Bible doctrine of the virgin birth. Why remove virgin from Isaiah 7:14? 
and inject young woman in its stead. Some of them put virgin in the footnote, but I believe truth belongs in the text and not just in a footnote. Why put a passage that, or why put a word that is incapable of telling the reader whether the young woman is virgin or non-virgin, whether she's married or unmarried, whether she's pure or impure. I believe virgin is the correct rendering of the great Hebrew term Alma, quite literally the Alma, Ha Alma. She's the one who is going to conceive and bear a son. Some of the new versions have dealt with Luke, the first chapter, in verse 27. For instance, when Mr. Robert Bratcher came out with today's English version, truly one of the worst Bibles to ever come out, he suggested an addition number one as he dealt with a Greek term, Parthenos, or Parthenos, that it was um, virgin. That's how he uh, translated Parthenos. But when he put out addition number two, he changed it to young girl. And uh, the New English Bible did the same. Well, now, the Greek term had not changed from his first edition to the second edition. It still was the same term. I believe that they are tampering with the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior. And in no sense of the term can the Christian religion survive in the absence of the virgin birth of our Lord. Destroy the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and down, down, down goes Christianity world without end. That's how critical and how crucial that doctrine is in the Bible. But in the next place, our glorious King is both Lord and Savior. He is both ruler and redeemer. In fact, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, referred to the fact, Acts 2 and 36, how that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. In Ephesians 5 and 31, God hath elevated or exalted the Son and made him to be Prince and Savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. He is referred to in John 13, 13 as Master and Lord. I do not believe that there is any real way to separate Jesus as Savior and Jesus as King. It's becoming quite popular and quite prominent among some of our brethren to try to separate Jesus as Savior and Jesus as King. Hence, we hear occasionally about Lordship Baptism. People have actually been led to be rebaptized because they've been approached on the basis did you really accept Jesus as both Lord and Savior? Or did you just accept Him as Savior? And if you've just accepted Him as Savior, you need to be baptized and accept Him as Lord, as ruler. I do not believe that Jesus Christ comes in peace, meal, fashion. Even though Paul was dealing with another problem, 1 Corinthians 1, he said, is Christ divided? That is, can you divide him up into little bits with one party having a portion of him and another party having another portion of him? This is a rhetorical question. It has its own built-in negative answer. No, Christ cannot be so divided. Well, if he cannot be divided among factions and parties, neither can he be divided as touching his saving power and his ruling and reigning powers. A year or two ago, I received a bulletin from a preacher who lives back in our area, and he really wrote this article before he had done his homework. He shouldn't have even begun that article because he really didn't know what he was talking about. But he told the number of years that had been since he had obeyed the gospel, or how long he had been a Christian. He told how long he had been preaching, but he said, almost a quote from him, it's only been within recent days that I have finally come around to accepting Christ as King. I have some questions that I would like to ask about that. In the first place, how does one accept Christ as Savior and reject Him as King? 
can one accept Jesus as Savior and not be born again? And when one is born again, he comes into the kingdom. How can he come into the kingdom without accepting Christ as his king? I have another question. I'm sure that young man would have said, when I accepted Christ as my Savior, I did so by obeying the gospel. How did he accept him as king? Was it simply a subjective type of thing in his own heart and mind that from henceforth onward he's going to be my king? Now, if a person can accept him as king subjectively, just within himself deciding that from henceforth Jesus is going to be my king, my ruler, why cannot the denominationalist justify himself when he says, I accept him as, quote, my personal savior, unquote, and do so subjectively, simply on the basis of feelings. And we hear that from Graham and all of the others, that just let Jesus Christ come into your heart. I make him my personal Savior, and he'll come in and save you. I suggest that a man who has that kind of concept, the young preacher I'm referring to, who tries to make a distinction between Christ as King and Christ as Savior, is really in no position to sit down with a denominationalist and really bring him into unadulterated New Testament Christianity. We've had entirely too much of this era of trying to distinguish between Christ as Savior and Christ as King. Do you know anybody in the New Testament who ever accepted him as Savior and rejected him as King? I don't believe the man lives or the woman lives who can point a finger to any New Testament example of trying to accept Jesus in piecemeal fashion. I have a sermon I sometimes preach on Christ, and I call it the Comprehensive Christ. I talk about Christ as the Christ of the cradle, and that's about the only concept of him that some people want. They get interested in a baby every December, and then the other 11 months of the year, Christ is almost a total non-entity to these people. Well, a baby doesn't make much much in the way of demands on a person's life, especially a baby born nearly 2,000 years ago. But there is also the Christ of the church. There is the Christ of the cosmos. There is the Christ of the creation. There is the Christ of the, of the cross. There is the Christ of the second coming. Christ must be accepted totally, completely, entirely, not in piecemeal fashion. Well, let me say something in the closing part of our lesson about the kingdom, the glorious kingdom of the glorious Christ, the glorious king. As mentioned earlier, the king cannot be separated from his kingdom. The head of the church cannot be separated from that which he had, namely the body. And the temple cannot be separated from him who built it. The vineyard cannot be separated from him who is its owner. It would be folly to try to separate the bridegroom from the bride, or the bride from the bridegroom. Christ, therefore, cannot be set forth without setting him forth in his kingdom, in his church. In dealing with the church or the kingdom, it is absolutely essential that we accept the predictive prophecies of the Old Testament in regard to the coming of that kingdom. Isaiah 2 and Micah 4 both point to the fact that it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord shall house shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Many people will say, Come ye. And let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. He'll direct us into his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord, from Jerusalem. That points to the coming of the kingdom or the establishment of the church. Micah says practically the same thing in Micah 4, 1 and 2. Daniel, in telling Nebuchadnezzar about his great dream, of the metallic image that he had seen and then had become the forgotten dream. He talked about the coming of those four kingdoms, the Babylonian kingdom of which Nebuchadnezzar was the head, 
the Medo-Persian kingdom to come next, then the Grecian Empire, and finally the Roman. And then it would be in the days of the Roman kings that the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Unlike these other kingdoms, it will not be broken up, it will not be shattered to pieces, as their destiny will be, Daniel is saying, but it is a kingdom that shall stand forever. The kingdom that the prophets saw is the church that Jesus came to establish. Premillennialism does not believe that, but premillennialism doesn't believe a great many things that are taught by way of predictive prophecy in the Old Testament and by way of precise fulfillment in the New Testament. The kingdom that the prophets saw is the very church that our Lord came to establish. In the next place, in regard to this glorious kingdom, it is essential that we accept the concept that its beginning was near at hand when the Christ and when the Immerser both began to preach. John said the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3, 2. Jesus declared it was at hand, Matthew 4 and 17. He sent out the twelve in Matthew 10, and they were to preach the nearness of that kingdom. The sent seventy in Luke 10 went forth, and they were to say, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you, Luke 10 and verse 9. Now add all of these together, and you have 84 gospel preachers. The Lord, the Messianic Harbinger, the Twelve, and the Seventy. And yet if premillennialism is so, that denies that the kingdom did come in that day and is still out there in the future, then the premillennial position makes liars out of every one of these 84 gospel preachers, including the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Some years back, a lady told me, you're too hard on premillennialism. It's not as bad as you're trying to tell us it is. I don't believe I've ever pictured it as bad as it really is. I doubt that any of you have ever pictured it quite as badly as it is. I don't believe that we can overemphasize how rotten to the core this system is. It's a system that makes a liar out of our own glorious king and a liar out of the other 83 that joined him in preaching that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God was near at hand. They taught that, and the New Testament tells about the fulfillment. Did it come in the first century? Oh, Paul said that it did, because he has the Colossians translated into it, Colossians 1 and 13. It would be interesting to see somebody translate it into something that didn't even exist. And John said in Revelation 1 and 9 that he and his fellow members on the mainland of Asia Minor the ones who constituted the seven churches in Asia, that they were in the kingdom and the patience of the Lord Jesus Christ? How could they be in something that wasn't even existing at the time? And the writer of Hebrews says that we have received a kingdom which cannot be moved, Hebrews 12 and 28. It's absolutely essential that we accept the truthfulness that the kingdom was promised to be near at hand and that it was actually established. In the next place, it is essential that we accept the fact, the New Testament fact, that the kingdom of heaven and the church of the Lord are one and the same. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus promised that upon this rock I will build my church. Yet in the next verse, he promises the keys to the kingdom of heaven to the apostle Peter. If the church and the kingdom are not one and the same, then Peter was given the wrong set of keys. He opened something that he had no right to open in Acts 2 because he opened the doors of the church to the people on the day of Pentecost, something he had no right to do if he only received the keys to the kingdom of heaven and that the kingdom of heaven and the church are different institutions. Remember, Jesus declared that I will set up a kingdom, or rather set up a table for you in my kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, Luke 22 and 29. And yet where was the Lord's Supper observed? Well, the church in Jerusalem were steadfast, or was steadfast, 
in observing the Lord's Supper, Acts 2 and 42. The church at Troas, Acts 20 and 7, observed the Lord's Supper when Paul and his traveling group were there for the Lord's Day. And the Bible teaches that the church in Corinth observed the Lord's Supper. Paul has quite a discussion about it in 1 Corinthians 11:20 through the end of the chapter. Remember in Revelation 1 how that John referred to himself and others as having been made a kingdom of priests, the American Standard tells us, Revelation 1 and 6, and yet who were members of this kingdom of priests? The churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I believe that we can just take Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3 and meet premillennialism and refute their doctrine that there is a difference between the church and the kingdom. But it is essential in the next place that we accept the king as being the proper one to tell us what to do in order that we might enter the kingdom and how we might retain membership in the same. Now the Lord has not left it up to the Billy Grahams and the Rex Humbards and the Oral Roberts or anybody else today to determine the entrance requirements to come into the kingdom. The Lord is the lawgiver. He's in the driver's seat and always has been. He's the one that determined what people were to do. And he suggested and had his apostles teach it over and over again how that people are required to hear. People are required to believe in his deity, repent of their sins, confess faith in him, and be baptized for the remission of sins. Those are the Lord's stipulations. Those are the commandments of the king. And why do we observe them? Because the king has commanded them. And while I'm on the plan of salvation, let me urge every gospel preacher in this audience never to preach a gospel sermon without telling people what to do in order to be saved. I listened to a radio sermon a while back that was being broadcast by one of our congregations in Tennessee. I was to begin a gospel meeting that Sunday night, driving from my home to the place where it was to begin, and just happened to pick up this broadcast. I listened to its entirety. Not one single time did he ever tell his audience, either the ones who were live before him, or all the ones who might be listening to him by radio, what to do in order to be saved. There may have been people who listened to that program by radio who did not know the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved?